This is the Tory Leadership Election podcast, brought to you by Conservative Home. I'm Paul Goodman, editor of Conservative Home, and with me is Mark Wallace, executive editor of Conservative Home. So, Mark, let's think about this Tory leadership contest, which has not yet officially begun, but essentially we've had its first week. That's uh, come and gone. So, Let's start off with some of the detail and then try and work our way through to think about the big picture of what's happening and what it means. So on the detail, let's just sort of start off looking at the parliamentary stage of this two-stage election as it begins and ask who's had a good week, who's had a bad week. In your view, let's start with a good week. Who's had that? I think it's undoubtedly been a good week for Rory Stewart, um, particularly if you think of his campaign not merely as a leadership election campaign, but perhaps as a campaign to lead one wing of the Conservative Party. And actually, he's still relatively new to the Cabinet. He's been the, good, the beneficiary of other people's misfortune in recent weeks in being promoted to the Cabinet. And he realises he's an outsider candidate, so he's grabbed the bull by the horns. Even people like myself who don't happen to share his view on, say, Brexit, or for that matter, probably various other things about, about modern Britain, can recognise that he's got a level of energy, just as he does as a, uh, as a minister, that quite a lot of his colleagues and rivals don't. And so I think he is starting to show up some of the others. Isn't this one of these instances where at once you actually start to challenge the terms or at least probe and debate the terms of the question? I and mean, I, I agree that he's had a good week, except I'm not quite sure what he's doing. Um, he can't win surely he may be building his profile, as so many people are in this um, uh, leadership contest, to sort of step up. But looking at him, I have kind of strange feeling that just as what he's done in a lot of his life is travelling, he's a famous travelling writer, it's kind of almost as though, sure, he's a proper Tory, but he's like passing through the Conservative Party on his journey to say whatever it is that he wants to say, whether it's in Barking or in Preston or whether he's wandering around Kew Gardens. So I'm kind of very interested in Rory Stewart, but in a funny way, I feel he's more being Rory Stewart than being a serious leadership contender. Yes. I mean, in this analogy, the Conservative Party of 2019 is the desert wastes of Afghanistan, which I, I, I'll it's leave that without there. comment, uh, without too much detail. But when it, when it comes down to it, he's there doing what he evidently believes. I, th- I think it's quite clear that he really very strongly thinks this. But it's also something that really, if you consider that that tradition of conservatism, it's been on its uppers. Ken Clark is close to retirement. Michael Heseltine has just been suspended from the Conservative whip for voting Lib Dem. And actually, really, this is a stronger showing from what some people would call One Nation, but perhaps a bit quite lazily, but a kind of TRG, perhaps more EU sympathetic kind of tradition of the Conservative Party. And actually, he is, like you say, a lot of the people he's talking to aren't actually going to have a vote in this contest. But he's certainly got the attention of his colleagues. He's certainly got the attention of the lobby and of the, the Twitter RT, which are not bad things to have in terms of positioning yourself politically. They're not at all. My candidate for um, a good week is, is more orthodox. I think, unlike Rory Stewart, the others are basically doing what you'd expect. I'm going to leave aside the more minor candidates to whom we will return in a moment and just look at what I think are the big five who've got properly funded campaigns, people who are helping them out who are experienced campaigners, most of whom have done fundraising, and at this stage are concentrated on getting endorsements from Conservative MPs. I think the person who's made the least errors and has therefore had a good week is Michael Gove, because at this stage um, you're in the business of amassing supporters. He's not really doing any better or any worse than most of the other uh, big five, as I call them. Uh, he's, he's doing okay. Um, I think he's he's third on roughly 20 uh, as we speak now. But what I think he's doing very well is the art of the announcement. Um, if you're Rory Stewart, you don't make any announcements because you're not really in the business of doing policy. If you're Boris Johnson, you don't do it either because you're the front runner. You don't want to take any risks. If you're Dominic Raab, you have to make a lot because people don't know you as well as they know Boris Johnson. You've got to take some risks. Goes the master of the announcement. That's how he's built his reputation at this environment department in particular. And his announcement about the rights of EU nationals was exactly where he wants to land. 
It's for liberal leavers. It's for soft Brexiteers. It presents him as a unifier who can bring everyone together. So I think he's had a good week or the least bad week of any of the series contenders. It's certainly effective campaigning. I, I, I definitely agree with that. I wonder if you know, perhaps there'll come a time later in the race where he'll do this. I wonder if he's yet to start answering some of the questions that some voters, some of the voters, MPs or members will have about him, particularly those leavers, even liberal ones, about exactly where he's been around the kind of Theresa May government. And I think that could be could prove to be quite a, a vulnerability for him. I think in the medium to, to long term, and long term here, we're now just talking weeks, I'm sure that's right. But back at this stage, um, where we're looking at uh, the very early days, people amassing numbers and so on, um, I think, as I say, he's done all right. And that really just leads me in this part of the discussion to a kind of final thought about the peculiar nature of it. I mean, the way it works, Mark, it is, um, of course, that to get nominated as a candidate, you really only need a couple of people. What we've got is a field so far of probably about 15 to 20 potential people. Um, clearly not all of them think they can win. Clearly some of them are doing this to boost, boost their profile and get a better post. What do you think about all that? Do you think the rules should be changed? Do you think it's denigrating the contest? Do you think IDS is right? Uh, to want to see and Duncan Smith to want to say that every candidate should have uh, 10 sponsors rather than just two. What do you think about it all? I think there's a weird kind of pomposity about the race, the concept of the leadership race that suddenly appeared. So actually, it's outrageous that someone would use a Tory leadership election to raise their profile. I mean, I can think of, we, we can all think of uh, some quite people with quite high profile now who've done that actually repeatedly, um, not to name any particular cabinet members' names. But it's not unreasonable to do that. It's not an unreasonable function of the race. And also, why shouldn't somebody be allowed to roll the dice if they happen to put their name forward, uh, perhaps spend money, certainly spend political capital, risk their reputation? You don't automatically get a better profile from being in a race. You can end up as a laughing stock. That may happen to some candidates now. So I think there's, there's a bit of prettiness, kind of saying, actually, it's unreasonable and it's somehow scandalous to use the race in this way. In terms of the, the idea of extending the number of signatures required, I'm very wary of something that provides more, effectively more centralised institutional power for people who happen to have group support or something, or something like that. I, I think the wider do, do, you keep the race... Do you think it actually would be illegitimate to change the rules now? This is a very interesting question because some of the people who don't like the change say the contest's underway, can't possibly change the rules now, to which an answer is, no, actually it hasn't begun till the 1922 committee receive nominations and set a form. If people have started campaigning now and Conservative Home and the rest of the media are covering it, that's fine, but it's not too late to change the rules. Yeah, in, in, indeed. In fact, there's there's a bit of melodrama coming from the opposite side of this debate as well, which, which is this idea that there would be some constitutional outrage to tinker with it now. In practice, this race has been running for a year. It's just involved everybody saying there's no vacancy, then making their leadership pitch. So um, the actual official race hasn't begun. We don't know the rules. We don't know the time scale. Um, it's not unreasonable to talk about different formats. I think, say, Johnny Mercer talked about changing the rules a couple of weeks ago to have four candidates in the final round rather than two. It's, it's reasonable to talk about it. I just think some of the ideas that are being talked about aren't very good ones. So just finishing off this bit of the conversation, uh, people will be wondering, I think, you know, who these big five that I named um, are, and they may disagree, but I think we've got um, Boris Johnson and Dominic Raab at the harder Brexity end, uh, and you've got um, uh, Jeremy Hunt uh, at the um, softer end, and Michael Gove and, and Santi Javid somewhere there with him. Um, that's kind of my take. Um, just leaving those people aside, what do we think about the other candidates in this uh, contest who've been named so far or may run other than Rory Stewart? I mean, what do we think about Matt Hancock, who's just behind that group in terms of numbers, or uh, Kit Malthouse, say, or James Cleverley, who are nearer the back? Or indeed Mark Harper. Or who's, indeed who's, Mark Harper. Who's, who's, I think, is the latest addition to the race. I mean, Again, it's part, it can be part of these contests that somebody who enters it, a little bit like, like an FA Cup, somebody who enters it potentially as a minnow can find themselves doing unexpectedly well. But you have a very short window of time really to establish yourself as a potential contender in this. And I think there is a real danger that uh, candidates who are perhaps struggling in some cases, some of those cases, to gain a bit of momentum, lowercase m, crucially, um, 
there's a fine art to judging exactly when is the right time to actually capture your position at its peak, to withdraw with the maximum amount of grace. Some of those candidates, there's still time for them to get really get stuck into this race, but, but, but the clock's ticking now. Bad week. Um, I'm going to be uh, unfair and gratuitous and name Sajid Javid. Why? Just simply because he's at the bottom of that list of the big five. Um, he's not overtaken the other four. Um, I think he has got a bit of a way to go in order to kind of prove he can catch up with people like Gove and Johnson who know how to play the media game. And although you know, I think he's not sort of made any particular mistake, he's the person now who needs, I think, to get a bit of acceleration to prove he's a serious candidate in this race, to demonstrate he can overtake some of these other people and to show that he's somehow not going to be trapped and caught between people with a very definite hard Brexit profile like Dominic Raab and a very definite soft one like Rory Stewart. What do you think? Yeah, he's got a very serious, um, sparky and quite experienced campaign team around him. And so you would hope that there'll be some kind of moment at which he sticks his elbows out and barges out some more space in the race. But he's definitely got He's got, got to prove something now. He's got to find, got to find that space. Is there a particular issue for him and for Jeremy Hunt, which is as follows? I mean, thinking about it, um, this has not been a successful government in terms of handling Brexit, the biggest uh, issue of the day. In fact, to say it's not been successful is an understatement. Hunt and um, Javid are both associated with it. They are very, very senior ministers of state. Furthermore... If they announce policy, they're going to be asked, well, why haven't you done that already? You're a senior minister. Whereas if Dominic Raab is asked something, he can announce whatever he likes. He's not in the government anymore. Yeah, and those are challenges of practicality as well as well as principle in terms of actually what, what their campaign's about. I mean, my choice for Bad Week would be Jeremy Hunt, partially for this reason. You need a very clear answer to say, well, given that the wheels came off, Theresa May's car quite a long time ago, why did you stay there till the bitter end? And uh, why didn't you improve it? But he's also, like Javid, has the challenge, of course, of having voted Remain, which is an issue, um, particularly due to Theresa May having put herself forward as somebody who supported Remain. I understand Brexit, I promise. I will honour this. I really get it. And then infamously hasn't. And she's really cleared the pitch for candidates like that. I think Jeremy Hunt's had a particularly bad week this week because his article that he wrote for The Telegraph, in which he cautioned actually against holding an election before fulfilling Brexit as a way to try, try to get no deal to happen as political suicide, was written up as saying no deal would be political suicide. And that really, he machine gunned his own feet there a bit, I think, because intentionally or otherwise, he played into some doubts that lever uh, uh, voters, and that's, remember, the majority of the Tory grassroots already have about a candidate in his position. So I think he's actually ended the week with more ground to make up. Let's come back to that later, because actually I thought that for all the difficulties with presentation, Jeremy Hunt was putting his finger on a big question, one of the big questions about this leadership election, what it means for the country. We'll come back to that in due course. And I want to sort of, the time's come to move on to the next bit of the discussion about what happens next week, because to date, for some of the listeners, this, this would have been a bit like listening to an in-depth discussion about football players where you're not quite sure of the rules of the game. So maybe we want to try to explore how this contest is going to work. Now, my understanding is next week's going to be pretty quiet. We've got Donald Trump's visit, if you can call that a quiet business, but it's got no immediate impact on the leadership election. The D-Day celebrations, I think the 1922 committee will be meeting to establish the final rules of the contest. But the first ballot, the parliamentary ballot, that, as I understand it, really isn't due to happen until the week after this one coming. Indeed, which means that, of course, we could find out there are yet more candidates. We know there are some people who are still considering this, some publicly, some privately, some somewhere between the two. Uh, we know, for example, that Penny Mordaunt has a phone call with, 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 with uh, grassroots conservatives, as she uh, wrote about on Concert of Home, happening next week to consider the future of the party. Uh, make of that what you will. Um, and of course, as we were referring to before, the actual definition of how this race will literally work, never mind just the timescale, mm. will be set out by the 22. And that means that there could yet be a row about that, but it'll affect the shape of everybody's campaigns. I suspect that there are you know, a wise big five 
leadership candidate will be sitting on a pile of endorsements, promised endorsements, with a, with a couple of different campaign grids laid out for when they'll drop them and actually exactly when they'll allow them to become known because they'll want to try and surprise their rivals but not seem like they're losing steam in the meantime. This is an important point about next week, in fact, that whatever happens, you'd expect them to keep dribbling out names of MP supporters in order at least not to lose momentum. There's a bit of a mystery here, isn't there? Because we really don't know how much capital any of them has in the bank. They may all have quite a bit. They may all have almost nothing at all, just one or two names each. It may be that one of them has actually got a big bank in reserve. We just don't know. Indeed, and as we saw in 2016, it's entirely possible that somebody could seem like they're going very well, have a very detailed plan, and actually the wheels can come off internally. So add into that, I think the potential for Donald Trump to storm into this process is also something we should take into account. We've already seen this week when he uh, described, say, Boris Johnson as his friend. That's the kind of thing that does start to have a bit of an impact in some Conservative MPs' minds. I think some will be very excited by that. Others will be somewhat concerned about the, how, how it looks to the British electorate. And if he... If, if Donald Trump does happen to be, I don't know, brash and egocentric and tasteless enough to use the D-Day celebrations to try and barge into another country's politics, hard to imagine as that is, then he could have quite a big impact on this race, negative or positive. This is very hard to predict. Should we think about Trump's capacity to cause surprises? But actually, what we're waiting for is the way he might do something, not what he'll do. I mean, Trump's not going to come out and say, hey, you know what? I think it'd be really great if you chose that Rory Stewart. It's all about Trump and Boris Johnson, isn't it? It's about whether in some way or another he's going to endorse him, see him, be photographed with him and so on. I mean, taking the bull by the horns, what do we think about this from Boris Johnson's point of view? Is it a good thing for him to have Trump's backing? No. I, I think he'll be... He and uh, if not him, then his, his, the people around him in his campaign ought to be hoping that Donald Trump kind of maybe nods at a distance in a somewhat inscrutable way and sends a private WhatsApp message saying, hi, how's it going? And that's about as far as it goes. If it ends up like Theresa May holding hands somewhere, um, or for that matter, getting you know, holding hands then dragged into a three-way handshake with, with Nigel Farage, then it can become a little bit of an issue, I think. The point's been made to me that one of the peculiarities of this election is that uh, the members are electing a party leader who will go on to be prime minister. So you've got sort of three audiences. You've got the MPs, you've got the party members, and then finally, out there, you've got the voters. I'm just asking whether it's different for those audiences in terms of Trump. So is it in some way, I'm just questioning what you said, a possible plus for Boris Johnson with the party members if he's endorsed by Trump. Maybe not with the MPs who collectively really don't like him. Maybe not with the voters who, as far as we can see, mostly dislike him even more. So the polling seems to suggest. With party members, is there some sort of plus in, in Johnson being shown to, I don't know, um, have the favour of the United States be able maybe to negotiate a trade deal? I think that's the absolute nub of it. If if what was to happen was it was to become clear that only one candidate can negotiate a free trade deal with the United States straight you know, by the end of this year, then that's a very different thing from saying, can we ever hug my, 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 my buddy? Do you remember that time we all hung out with some girls? That, that, you know, the, the different extremes of the race. I, there's, there's very different things that can happen there. A best case scenario, if there is the, the Donald kind of closing in on a, a leadership candidate, would be to, for it just to be talking about trade, and that's about it. And just again, I mean, looking forward, just very briefly, beyond next week, the week after, we know that there's a 92 group hustings on the Monday evening. I think that's the 10th of uh, that group of sort of broadly right of centre in Tory terms MPs. Then we would expect the ballots in that week, and probably maybe quite a lot of them if they've got a lot of candidates to get through. 
Indeed, and a lot of that starts to fall into this question of whether, and if so, when candidates decide that, um, th that there's no more road for their for their leadership cam campaign. Some may drop out before the first ballot if they, you know, some have considered uh, testing the water and have decided not to launch leadership campaigns. Some who've launched may decide that there's uh, th there simply isn't the proper enough of a following for them, and then you have the actual race itself, which rather than eliminating candidates one at a time, can sometimes put a scythe right through the whole field. Now, finally, uh, for this podcast, let's just take a step back from all the Westminster Village analysis and gossip and who's up and who's down and what's happening. I mean, what's the big picture here? I mean, for me, I'm struck by the thought that there's a, a relationship between this mass of candidates and the condition of the Tory party. I mean, it's like seeing a, a medieval kingdom with a kind of weak monarch, this kind of shortly to abdicate monarch, Theresa May, and this series of barons running around uh, in sort of late medieval England, sort of running up banners and trying to pinch each other's cattle. It looks as though the kingdom is very weak. And that's because really, it is. It's being threatened from the outside, not only by its old opponents, its traditional opponents like the Labour Party, but by revived Liberal Democrats and above all by the Brexit Party. I mean, there is, without being hysterical, there could be or there is an existential threat here, isn't there? A huge, huge threat. And as we found in Conservative Homes surveys of party members before the European election, about 60% said they were going to vote for the Brexit party. YouGov have just found in their polling after the election that 60%, 59% voted for the Brexit party. That's of Conservative members. The opinion polling for general election intention is woeful, is dire for the Conservative party. Also for Labour, says Downing Street, but frankly, who cares when it comes to the serious problems facing the Conservative Party. And the one other thing that's happening is the Peterborough by-election, where the Brexit Party are, they say, making that their next big goal. So one way or another, the mortar bombs continuing to land inside the Conservative Party's own kind of affairs. I feel it's in a strange way, although I agree with you that he's not had a great week, I do feel at least Jeremy Hunt, fun enough, came the closest to try to deal with one of the really big issues at stake, which is what are you going to do on October the 31st? What's this new prime minister going to do if there isn't an agreement? Because the, the, the options are yet another extension. They are to throw your hands up and say you're going to try and obtain a second referendum. Um, they are to say you're going to try to revoke Brexit uh, altogether. Or they are to say you're going to go out with no deal, other than staggering on towards nowhere and nothing in particular. I think those are the options, and at least Hunt was trying to deal with it. But I do feel that none of the candidates have really made this very plain, and that they're all frightened of something that perhaps lies at the bottom of the discussion, which is the thought, OK, well, if, if you do... Um, uh, have a deal that the Commons won't agree to, or you're stuck, are you going to try and call a general election? Because Tory MPs on the whole don't want one. They're being asked, they will be asking the candidates, you know, are you, uh, are you going to call one or not? The pressure on the candidates to be straight up about this is enormous. But I don't feel they are being, do you? We've had very little comment about this beyond, beyond, as you say, from Hunt. And this is somewhere where those three audiences you mentioned earlier, the MPs, the members and the voters, do feel very, very differently about this, I suspect. Um, members will most likely be quite trepidatious about the prospect, but in some ways for different reasons to Conservative MPs. Some Conservative MPs believe they would lose their seats even if a Conservative majority was to be secured in an election because they think that a pivot in the country of winning some former Labour leave seats would involve losing some former Tory Remain seats. And so there are some who aren't even thinking just about the question of Tory government or keeping Corbyn out. Thinking about number one even it isn't necessarily good news for them. You see, almost whatever you do if you're the new leader, this election question comes up because if you wanted to um, extend, it, it might. If you suddenly turned tail and said you wanted a second referendum, it definitely would because a section of the Conservative Party might well not be able to live with that. Um, if you wanted to revoke, obviously you'd again be vulnerable in a no-confidence vote. 
Um, if you want no deal, well, Philip Hammond um, and that particular section of that particular bit of the party, again, look as though they might not support you in a no-confidence vote. So the possibility of an election really is real. And, you know, I, I'm repeating the conversation, but I don't think the candidates have dealt with it at all. Indeed, it comes back in some ways to the heft that a candidate can promise that they have. Are they somebody who can demonstrate very vividly that they're big enough to change either the nature of things in Parliament or the nature of things in the country before the end of October, or for that matter, the, end, the nature of things in Brussels. And actually, really, if you wanted to do any of those things, you've got to do the others as well. If you, want to, if you can say, well, I would be able to win a majority in the Commons, in part, I would have to rest on a belief in the Commons that you change people's views in the country. If you say, I can get a new deal in Brussels, it would have to be based on the idea that you change things in Parliament enough, and that would have to rest probably on MPs, opposition MPs in particular, thinking you'd change voters' minds. So that is the big race of just saying, actually, I'm somehow powerful enough, or clever enough, or I've got the, 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 the magic formula that will actually switch this around really quite quickly. And that, that's why this race is so think, I th And I think in, in due course, which means soon, which means maybe next week, we should have a talk about precisely which candidates, if any, could have that transformative effect on the voluntary party, on Tory MPs and on voters as a, as a whole. But just for uh, the moment to um, absolutely close um, this week off altogether, finally, this will be um, – a Brexit election, won't it? I mean, Tory leadership contests recently, they've tended to divide into two sorts. There's how can we revive the party, David Cameron in 2005, and what do we do about Europe, Ian Duncan Smith in 2001, when he, he beat Ken Clark in that final. I think this is much more like 2001, and that for better or on balance for worse, um, all these interest groups, the the onwards, the, the freers, bright blue, all the rest of them, like us to some degree, they're going to have quite a frustrating leadership election because anything else is going to be struggle to um, get heard above the noise. And that includes really big questions like economic policy and what the function and role of the state should be, how much you're going to borrow, how much tax people are going to pay, how you think the economy and society should work. I don't think we're going to hear all that much about it that's going to cut through. Yeah, and the real danger actually with the, in terms of what the electorate are hearing is that also applies to what you would do with the liberties you get from Brexit. Actually making the most of Brexit once you've done it is in danger of being crowded out by how do you get Brexit to happen. And as Theresa May's found out, if you can't do that, you don't get the right to do anything. Mark, thank you very much. The Conservative Home Tory Leadership Election podcast will be back next week.